Welcome back to the Words from the Nerds podcast. We are back with episode two of our Road to Kenobi series. And once again, I am joined by Ben from Aspire Entertainment. Ben, why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, I am very excited to be here once again. Just working through these these episodes of the prequels <laughs> has been, it's been a blast. And yeah. I've been talking about it on TikTok as well. And I think we've just had had a fun time. And my excitement for Kenobi, I think, is like, ramping up a lot just from watching these episodes so i'm very glad to be here yes yes and we have been posting a lot about it on tiktok and i do want to say before we get started an audio version will be on spotify uh we ran into some technical difficulties so i'm trying to get that all set up right now it should just be words from the nerds podcast and both episodes should be up there by tuesday at 10 a.m so trying to trying to uh, get all that figured out so let's go ahead and talk about attack of the clones Initial thoughts on this movie. Why don't you start us off? Initial thoughts. I think I think I liked it more than I remember from the last time that I watched it, which it still has been a few years since I've worked my way through all of these movies. But I, I enjoyed a lot of aspects of it. I think I kind of felt similarly to The Phantom Menace, where like there are a lot more noticeable flaws with it, and a lot of honestly similar flaws like The Phantom Menace. But I think there's still a lot of like redemptive qualities to it. And it's a very enjoyable movie. Like I didn't find myself ever bored with the film. And I think it was more enjoyable to rewatch than The Phantom Menace. I think from what I said about The Phantom Menace, one of my biggest issues was like the pacing because it felt like they were trying to juggle so much all at once all the time. Yeah. Whereas like I feel like this movie handled that much better it still had a little bit of elements of that but just overall it was it was a lot more fun to rewatch, and i had i had more fun than i expected to i think i just in general had a had a good time with it while probably recognizing more flaws than i would have when i was younger yeah yeah that's a good point because i i also enjoyed this more than i enjoyed the phantom menace and i never really understood the hate on attack of the clones i think the biggest thing is just like the dialogue because George Lucas cannot write romance like to save his <laughs> life. So once you kind of put that aside and get through all the Anakin and Padme scenes, I mean, it's a good, it's a fun movie, you know? It. I think The Phantom Menace was kind of like a bit slower, and this one is just, you know, boom, 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 boom. And we also get Anakin and in, in a little bit more grown up and Obi-Wan grown up. So I enjoyed it. I think I think it was a great movie. I do enjoy this po- the poster, the Attack of the Clones poster, more than uh episode three or or episode one i think Hmm. i think the uh attack of the clones poster is more i mean like with Django fed and then you have anakin and padme and yeah i i love the poster so even just just that is a big step up so yeah i enjoyed the movie i thought it was i thought it was very very fun um i guess we can kind of get i like getting all the negatives out of the way first okay okay we can kind of get into into what we didn't like um I guess I'll start us off this time. I'm always making okay. you start us off. So, uh, like I said, the dialogue. I mean, the dialogue is just it's just hard. It's really hard to get through at times. And especially, I feel like it's more just like Anakin and, and Padme. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's Anakin's, his acting, because it, it, it is a bit rough. I love Anakin. Anakin's my favorite Star Wars character of all time. I love him. But his acting was a bit rough in this in this movie. I, I found I can't remember if it gets better in, in episode three. I'm sure it does, but um, yeah, I don't know. His acting was just it just wasn't that good. So I don't know if it's if it's from that or if it's the script because that that is a big problem as well. But I mean, just like he was just so creepy to like Padme, yeah. like he's complaining that she turns the cameras off because she doesn't want him watching her, <laughs> and then. Like he's saying that, you know, he's making her uncomfortable and saying that she likes it. It's just like, you know, and then she falls for him. After all that, she falls for him and gets married with him. So I think that was a big, a big no, no from me. Did you, did you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. (laughs) Yeah. Going back to George Lucas can't write romance. Give him credit where credit is due. At least it's not with a child this time. <laughs> like, at least yeah. it's at least it, even if it's cringy, cringy. At least it's yeah. okay, you know. But yeah. yeah, you're you're definitely right. And I mean, I think while Anakin did have a lot of like cheesy dialogue, and their relationship was sometimes like hard to watch. 
I think it almost went both ways sometimes. Like she didn't always have the best dialogue. I think yeah. there was a line specifically. It, it was pretty early on in the movie where she's like, don't look at me like that. And <laughs> then she's like, it makes me uncomfortable. And it's like, that's such a weird thing to say to somebody like to <laughs> not look at you a certain way. And yeah. yeah. So like, the, I think there was a lot on both sides that was interesting. And you're right that like, by the end, I don't think it was justified that all of a sudden she fell in love and wanted yeah. him, even though like they did go through a lot together, like, you know, the death of his mother and all these emotions. And I know that he was, I mean, he was head over heels since apparently the first movie and he like never stopped thinking about her. I'm more so, I guess the, the part that I don't fully believe is how from the start of this episode to the end, how she fell for him. Because for yeah. him, I think it made sense. He was always like devoted to her, always thought about her type of thing. Yeah, for Whereas sure. for her, all of it happened in this episode, and I don't, I don't think it was yeah. that compelling, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't know how she fell for him at all, let alone getting married to him by the end of the movie. Like I understand him, obviously. He thought she was an angel in the first movie, so you know that's justified. But her, on the other hand, like. I didn't I didn't really understand it, but if you put that aside, I mean the the movie's good for what it is. And I, I did, you know, rag on his his acting a little bit in this movie, but but I kind of feel like it it's fitting for his character. It's fitting for the role of Anakin. He's kind of just like a an awkward, an awkward dude. I mean, from from whenever he first meets uh Padme after however many however much years it's been, uh he he kind of just turns on that like angry teen, you know, because with Obi-Wan, he, they're talking, they're joking in the elevator. And then as soon as he's with Padme, he's real like stubborn with him. Like, mm -hmm. dude, stop. Like, you know, like, like a little teenager. So it, it's good. He played the role like he was supposed to, you know, but there are still some times where his acting is a bit rough. I mean, was there any of that? Like, like, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I definitely think that, like the thing that I noticed the most is the contrast between his acting versus Obi-Wan's character, because I think Ian McGregor did a great job with Obi-Wan in this movie. And he, or even just if you contrast that with like smaller characters like Mace Windu or Count Dooku, things like that, where like they feel more natural in their roles. Whereas I feel like, yeah, Anakin and Padme suffered a bit, mainly because of the dialogue. Like that's yeah. the biggest thing is like, I feel like every other character is so much more well written for who they should be. Whereas the dialogue just doesn't fit it for what they're presenting it as. I feel like they did a decent job with what they were given, but they weren't set up yeah. well. That's like the biggest thing in my mind. So yeah. It, yeah, it definitely was lacking it sometimes, but I don't think it's like, I don't think it's all the fault of their performance. Yeah. Yeah. I can agree with that. And Another thing, this is kind of like, this is kind of a like, what is it? Two, like one step forward, two steps back kind of thing. The CGI is a lot better in this movie. I don't know if I said that right, but the CGI is a lot better in this movie. But they, there's just a lot of scenes that it's just kind of like unnecessary to use the CGI. Yeah. And I, I think uh, I had an example of whenever he's writing that like, big looking thing on that boo it's oh, like gosh. why well like why'd you have to cgi that there was there was no reason to or why'd you have to do it in the first why place, it the first place? Why yeah. is it there yeah it's just like it was just unnecessary and then like the most jarring one is like the pair when he's like using the force to give her the pair and cut yes. it open. It's, you can just tell it's just so like poorly done and I, yeah yeah, you have anything to say on that uh, yeah i had i had two other things that stood out for uh -huh. poor visual effects explosions to me did not yeah. look great like anytime they were used like the Django fight with obi-wan or even later into the movie like i feel like when it comes to explosions and water simulations like visual effects have become just so much better from you know 2002 when this movie came out so that oh, one yeah. stood out the other one is it's more of a minor thing but it was very noticeable the ending lightsaber duel i know that like 
for Count Dooku that like obviously having such an old actor, he didn't do a lot of the actual like stunt work for it. But specifically when him and Yoda were fighting, because Yoda is a rendered CG character, they had this like really nice glow from the lightsabers onto Yoda. But then for Mm. Count Dooku, it's just complete darkness. Like you don't see a red glow on him or anything, which I know is like such a minor nitpick. But when you have these two characters next to each other, there's like a big contrast between the two. And I noticed that. But maybe that's yeah. a little little picky, but it's definitely something that like it stuck out to me. Yeah, I've always wondered why they never used because I know I know once Disney acquired Star Wars and started making their own movies and shows, they they use the light. The um, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like a light rod so that you don't have mm-hmm. to like put that glow in, you know, post yeah. production or or even just ignore it you have it there like naturally so it looks better Mm -hmm. and so i always wondered why they never did that i'm sure you you have access i mean it's 2000 you know it's 2002 it's not 1980 or 1970 so i'm sure you have access to that so i I always wondered why they never did that because there is a lot of scenes like um they did it a little bit when um dooku and anakin are fighting because that's a really cool scene because anakin has the the red and blue going over him kind of showing his, his internal struggle but other than that, I mean, it does. They don't really show it much. Like the, the glow from the lightsaber, it's a lightsaber. You know, you need the glow. So, and I, I never really understood why they didn't do that. I yeah, I don't know why because they they definitely had the ability to. I I think it all goes back to the overuse of the CGI throughout the entirety of the prequels. Because yeah, one more thing that's noticeable about the visual effects that kind of ties into this about like just overuse and unnecessary overuse is how none of the clone troopers that we see are actual, you yeah. know, like real suits or anything. And like, I get it for some of the shots, like the big shots where you have a ton, like walking into like a Venator or whatever the ship is towards the end. Like mm-hmm. that makes sense to be a CG shot. And like, it doesn't even look that bad because of, you know, big scale, everything is smaller. But like when we see up close, the clone troopers, like you yeah. can just tell and it doesn't look great. When, I mean, you contrast that with like when they use real practical things. In this case, it's a bunch of the Viceroy's again, which were yeah. in episode one, or even just back to the original Star Wars movies with all stormtroopers and scout troopers. Like the real just looks a lot better in this case. So yeah. I'm not sure why they didn't use real, but I'm pretty sure it was just because like they just use visual effects for so much. I've seen a lot of the behind the scenes where you'll have like, Ian McGregor literally on a green screen, just like flopping around, fighting at nothing. And they just like made it work, you know? And yeah. that was the case for a lot of these movies. And it it doesn't work in everything. So I yeah. think, yeah, it's very, very lacking. And they should have just taken a different approach to make it work. That's the biggest thing is they could have. Yeah. But they just decided that, you know, visual effects were becoming more popular and they definitely overused them. Yeah, they did. I mean, one one scene that was like kind of cool, but you could obviously tell it looked like it was out of a video game, but it was still a really cool shot. Was the um the I call them stormtroopers, the clones versus the droids, uh, kind of I guess towards the end of the movie with like the dust the everywhere, dust, and, yes. and you just kind of see that was so nice. Like it looked so cool, but it looked like it was out of a video game, you know? Yeah, I. I love that scene and I actually think that's one of the scenes that works really well just because of the dust element and going back to like the lightsaber reflecting on faces and everything with like the glow what that scene did really well is because like I said with Yoda how since he's a computer generated character they could have the glow on him with the clone troopers versus droids in the dust because everything in that scene was done through computer generated images they had like the glow and reflections on everything just looked really cool. Like I loved that scene. And when I saw it, I'm like, I wish we had more of that, you know, like it was only like 10 seconds long or something. So I wish it was kind of more of that, but you're right that, that, that was, that was really cool. I love that. Yeah. And that's why I said like the CGI is way better. Like it's a, it's a big step up. I just feel like there's a lot of, there's still, you know, one, there's still some more like tweaks and mistakes you have to correct, but also like 
I feel like they kind of just got too ahead of themselves, like having Anakin on a little pig creature. Like, <laughs> you don't really like you don't really need to put that in yeah. there or even CGI it if you're going to leave it in there. But another another little quick scene that I thought the CGI was really cool and was the uh, the metal, the, the little metal refi- refinery where they're making all the droids. Mm-hmm. I thought the CGI looked really cool there. And and the way they 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 did that scene was really cool, but it just I feel like that scene didn't even need to be in the movie. Like it's a it's yeah. a two and a half hour movie, and I think that that whole sequence, you know, cutting away and cutting back to it, was like 10, 15 minutes. I don't know, but either way, I just feel like it it, it just resulted in C three PO's head getting switched on another droid, and Anakin and Padme getting caught and and put into the. Um, battle arena on geonosis so it's like is is there like a quicker way we could just get to that you know yeah uh, that conclusion? i think the only other thing is anakin his lightsaber got Breaks. cut in half yeah yeah but i think like considering they got captured like it doesn't make a difference you know he would have yeah. lost it either way so exactly you're right uh, yeah i don't know i just i felt like in a two and a half hour movie that scene really didn't belong <laughs> but at least the CGI was good in it, you know. I, if anything, they can just say they used it to practice on their CGI. So <laughs> I'm pretty I, sure most most of that was CGI as well, like yeah, the whole factory. <laughs> exactly, and it didn't look bad. I mean, I, no. I was thinking out loud that, or I was thinking to myself that it looked really cool, especially compared to the Phantom Menace. Um, was there any other negative spots uh, you could you had with this movie? Yeah, I would say. Uh-huh. I would say similar to the Phantom Menace, there are still some pacing issues in my opinion. Okay. I, I know we talked about in the Phantom Menace how there would be like three or four things going on that it would like cut to like 30 second scenes and then just cut back and forth between a bunch of things. And I feel like this movie did a much better job with that, but there were still some elements of it. Not quite as noticeable, but it would be like, oh, we're only like 30 seconds or a minute here cutting between two different things. It flowed a lot better, but I still feel like there were times where we would like be in a scene and then it would cut to something else. And I'm like, no, why, why can't we just like stay there for a little bit longer? Yeah. And that was pretty consistent throughout the movie for me, at least. And it, it usually would cut to the things that felt unnecessary, you know, like I think it was, I'm trying to remember which scene it was cutting back and forth between, but like when we had the Obi-Wan going to Camino and everything, like yeah. in my mind they could have just had that whole sequence leading up to his battle all as like one thing but instead i forget what they were cutting back and forth to probably something with anakin and pat <laughs> yeah probably, like, probably. so it, it's just like sure we can have those moments with anakin and padme but do i really want to cut back and forth between that and obi-wan and the tension yeah. with jango fett and the battle and everything so yeah. from that standpoint it like I guess when when the pacing is like that, it can make me less excited for those moments because it's like instead of being super excited through a whole sequence, now it's like in between the sequence, I have to deal with a cringy romance story between Anakin and Padme yeah. that I don't want to be at because I want to get back to the cool stuff. And yeah. it like lowers my excitement of what I'm seeing, which I think like hurts the movie a little bit because I do get like less excited as I'm as I'm watching it. Yeah, I see. I, I I wonder if the Camino scene was being cut with um, Anakin and Padme on Naboo, but I, I wonder if if one of those scenes was the sand scene. Because <laughs> if it was, I'm gonna be so mad that they cut away from Jango and Kenobi for that. It. I feel like it had to be. It might have been Tatooine. Just because right after yeah. Obi Wan fights Django and they do like the whole space scene, then he goes immediately to Geonosis, and at that point, Anakin and Padme come over there. So it might be while they're at Tatooine. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because they they get that message from uh, Kenobi when he's getting on, when he's just landing on Geonosis, he he sends that that uh, message through, and then she she says they have to send it to uh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm blinking. That they have to get that to Coruscant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, I think man, they were on Tatooine. That? Yeah. So I don't know. It it might have been some during his like mother's death and that whole sequence. Yeah. 
but also I'm pretty sure there's a pretty large chunk after that where he's like mourning the death and talking to yeah. everybody about it and everything. So yeah, but yeah, they definitely go from there to Geonosis. So, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's what it was cutting back and forth between. And it still to me made the, the whole Camino sequence a little bit less exciting than I wanted it to be. Cause it's a great sequence. Yeah. yeah. So. I, I think the Camino, the Camino sequence, sequence is one of my favorite parts of the movie and if i had to live on any planet in star wars it'd probably be camino because it's <laughs> really? like yeah you have it rains all the time and like i love the rain but it's just like so futuristic and like smooth and simple in there and everything's like aesthetic i don't know i i, I love camino i had that in here that camino is like one of my favorite planets I think it looks really cool and I love yeah. I do love the whole like it's all watery and like all that. I do think it's very beautiful. Mm. I think we even got a flashback scene in the book of Boba Fett and we got a like modern look at yeah. Camino a couple of times oh. and that was really cool. Yeah. But I don't know, raining all the time. I feel like uh. I feel like it would get old quickly. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe especially Especially considering how little there is there on the yeah. planet. There's yeah. not much to do there. I mean, if you're in the Star Wars universe and you can go anywhere, though, yeah, I'd definitely go there for a while, for sure. It's Yeah, cool. maybe just to take a vacation over there, I guess. Um, yeah. All right, let's... I guess we can get into what we loved about this movie. And I could talk about a lot of stuff here. So um, why don't you go ahead and start us off with something that, that stood out to you that you really liked? Yeah. I, I think I'll just start off continuing talking about Camino and yeah. not only Camino, but the uh, chase that they had through the asteroid field directly after that, yeah. because that's a sequence that I also adore. Like those two scenes together, probably yeah, highlight of the movie or like one of the best sequences of this movie, in my opinion, yeah. which is why it made it more disappointing with the whole pacing <laughs> issues. But yeah, I, I think it was really interesting not even just like how cool the scene is or how cool it looks, but I even loved the discovery that Obi-Wan is having as he gets there and he's talking yeah. to the Kiminoans, like when he's talking to like Tan We and everything uh, about the droid or about the clone army and about what's the what's the Jedi's name? Is it Sifidius? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sifidius. Yeah. And like as he's discovering that, I think that's a, a really cool like reveal and i love how all these things were in the works without the jedi knowing it's just an interesting way that they tied in the clone army into where this series is currently at yeah and i just think it works well like it's a it's a great way to introduce it and i just love the dynamic of him getting there and discovering it and everything like that so i think the whole sequence is really cool and not even just because like we get introduced to the clone army or anything. I also just think like story wise, it's a really critical place for where everything is at. And I, I loved that part of it. Yeah. I loved that scene, everything with Camino to like the chase down to Geonosis. And I think I, I saw a quick uh, or a cool little, another cool little fact, I guess I'll make this a, a, a weekly thing in these episodes. Okay. But apparently Sifo Diaz his name it was supposed to be Sido Dias, a D instead of an F, and it was supposed to be kind of like a a little code name for Sidious. Sidious. Yeah. yeah. But uh I guess there was a typo in the script that no. they left it as Sifo. So George Lucas just did a whole, you know, backstory on him and made him a whole like Jedi. So Dang. I thought that was pretty cool. But because it was cool. Up until then, when I, I mean, when I first watched this movie, I was like, Sidious is behind all of it. He's the one he had yeah. this, the clone army and all of this stuff from the beginning. So that was pretty cool. And that's a cool little little thing that they decided to do over just a typo. But another thing on on like on Kamino and, and getting introduced to Jango Fett and everything, I feel like, you know, Obi-Wan and Jango Fett, their little like their beef and and their conflict is so cool because they're they're two of like the most interesting characters. They're kind of the same, you know, like just mm -hmm. cool, calm and collected going about their thing. And Jango Fett, that blue and and uh, silver armor in the rain and 
and in the uh in the lab just looks so nice and he yeah. was he was really cool i think he was behind anakin and he was probably like my favorite character in this movie wow. uh and it's in, it's unfortunate that mace windu had to like <laughs> behead him but yeah that that whole scene and their, their fight was really cool because like just the way i don't know if, if Django was cgi or, or anything but like the way he was moving and and like his gadgets and everything it was just all like so so like pleasing to look at and like so entertaining and especially fighting obi-wan without his like lightsaber it was like one of the best non-lightsaber fights that we've had so far in my opinion would you would you agree with that yeah i i would say so i think for the a lot of the hand-to-hand close-up stuff that they had like two actual either stunt performers or the actual actors doing it but I think there, I think there was a large amount of CGI for some of the other stuff that they did. But I yeah. do think that it looked really good, and the setting of Camino being in the rain type of thing, it it made the battle really cool and just yeah. look super pleasing. And yeah, it's it's definitely a highlight. I did want to mention one more thing, mm-hmm. going back a little bit to the Sifo-Dyas Sidious mentioned. Yeah. Because in that scene, don't they also mention Darth Tyrannus, which is Count Dooku's Dooku. technical name, yeah. like as a Sith? So I thought that was interesting because like they did have the whole like Jedi that was supposedly responsible, but also like I think it was Jango Fett who mentioned that he was hired by yeah. Tyrannus, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of cool because like from the first conflict of the movie, we have Jango's assistant. And then Django's an assistant of Dooku. Dooku's an assistant of Palpatine. So it all goes back to Palpatine. And it just it shows how big like his his overall plan is and how it all just like falls into the place. You know, he has his assistants, assistants, assistants doing his dirty work. So yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. But yeah, jumping back to Camino, I I agree that that part was probably one of the most crucial moments in the movie. And it was cool to see a little like kind of like spy work with Obi-Wan and um kind of derailing here a little bit but i'm hoping we get to see that in andor you know now that obi-wan is kind of rumored to be in the andor series it'd be cool to get a little like buddy cop spy star wars type show um set in that that time period so yeah i enjoyed that it was it was cool yeah i love me some obi-wan so yeah (laughs) i'll take it yeah and the um the the chase through the the meteor the meteor field was like really cool as well and it gave us what is in my opinion the best sound in star wars oh the size oh it's just about the seismic charge literally like that is the best sound in star wars and i remember when we got it for season two of the mandalorian Uh, that because it was like all modern and crisp it was beautiful Yeah, and then I think we got it once in Book of Boba Fett. Yes, through um, when he was destroying the Rancor. <laughs> yeah, it, it just it wasn't that. Uh, or, or was it the? Uh, are you talking about the Sarlacc when he? Uh, Sarlacc, yeah. Sarlacc. I mix up those all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I think I got roasted <laughs> a couple times on TikTok for mixing up Rancor and Sarlacc. Oh uh, no! But yeah, that one was cool. But it was kind of like suppressed, right? The noise was because it was underground. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. still, that's one of the most satisfying sounds in all of Star Wars. For some reason, I thought that it happened more in this space scene. Like, I remember it happening more. And mm-hmm. so when I got to it, and I don't... How many times was it in this was it, scene? Was it three? It might have been three. I don't know why, but I remember it being, like, a lot more. And so I was kind of, like, getting excited for it just because the sound is so nice. Yeah. And then I was just like, oh, shoot, that's it? Like... I was kind of expecting a little more. I think the whole space scene was just shorter than I remember, but maybe I just have like fond memories of it because it is such a, such a highlight. Yeah. And, and like taking a step back and looking at the whole movie, there's a bunch of like just action packed, crazy scenes, you know? So yeah, I can, I can see how you kind of like get everything confused with each other. Yeah. So I think going back on the, the seismic charge, I think my second favorite Star Wars sound I've always loved, and I think these are like my favorite ships also, is the, the TIE Fighter. The, yeah, the yeah. sound of the TIE Fighter shooting. I've always loved TIE Fighters, so 
I think I'd have those two up there. I actually have a much better appreciation for the regular blaster sound. So oh, I know yeah. that we've we've uh, you've done some fun facts. So I'll hit you with a fun fact. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> and this is not like I didn't research this recently, but I remember mm. when I saw it. Have you seen the behind the scenes for how they did those sound effects, especially way back when? No, I mean I've seen I've seen some, but I, none that I can really remember. They would use different like metal tools and hit like different types of like power lines and stuff like that uh, and so like as they would hit it and it would like go all the way down the line you would just yeah. hear it's, it's a Dang. beautiful sound and i loved hearing them as they're like testing out different things for different sounds for what it can yeah. hear like because you hear it and it's just you can hear it you know and you can visualize what that looks like from star yeah. wars so it's really uh. cool how I mean, a lot of what they had to do for, I mean, they even do this nowadays, but a lot of what they had to do for sound effects back then is they're like, okay, we have these like, you know, laser guns. We need to go out and test what we can hit to make those sounds and everything. Whereas yeah. nowadays there's massive sound libraries with people have done millions of different mm. things with sounds. Back then yeah. it was like, we have to go and engineer this and it's really <laughs> cool. Yeah. Some of the techniques that they used yeah I, I nothing will ever beat that it's just so satisfying and i love that i think the was it the first or the second i think it was the first the first ant-man movie how they used uh i think the wasp i think anytime he shot scott lang um they used the the tie fighter sound and they kind of like messed with it a little bit to where every time he shot him it made the sound a tie fighter made Okay, so quick editor's note. Uh, I didn't realize that the actual blaster sound effect from Yellow Jacket in Ant-Man 1 was AT-ATs in Empire Strikes Back. They were not TIE Fighter sound bites. It was the, the uh, sound effect of the AT-AT blasting in Empire Strikes Back. So I completely messed that up. I remember hearing that fact a long time ago, so my memory wasn't all the way there. But, I mean, it's still a cool fact, just I got it kind of wrong. So enjoy the rest of the podcast. Hmm interesting yeah. Yeah. i didn't notice that actually yeah see if see if after this you can find a, a little youtube video or, or go on disney plus and look at it but they use i think they even admitted to it they said yeah we use the tie fighter the sound of a tie fighter shooting mm -hmm. so whenever i think it's a little train scene when they're like small yeah, and yeah he's yeah. like shooting at him uh it's the sound of a tie fighter okay yeah dude it's i'll have so to check sick. that out yeah all right, switching back. Let's get back into the movie. Yes. Um, my like favorite part of the movie is that there's barely any Jar Jar Binks. That's, <laughs> there's barely any Jar Jar Binks. But the Jar Jar Binks we had was so bad. Yeah, I know. But he did say, kind of save the day. He did save the day calling the, the clones out to Geonosis to kind of get them in there and save the Jedi. So, But also didn't he kind of mess things up by letting – palpatine get power yeah i mean char jar I, I kind of wonder like how different would all this be if he just it's the, that <laughs> okay to be honest the biggest what if question is what if qui-gon had won the darth maul duel the second yeah. biggest one is what if jar jar never existed never existed like, i'm not even joking yeah he has had such a big effect on so much that has happened and I don't yeah. like it. I don't like it. I don't. And I, I especially don't like him. But I was glad that we didn't get as much of him as we did in the first movie. The first movie, it was just unbearable. He was he probably had more screen time than Anakin did. So. And the first movie, I think <laughs> yeah. that's I think that's true. Like yeah. actually true. Yeah. Uh so I'm glad we, we got away from that. So I, I want to talk about like themes in this movie. Like I love one of my favorite themes is Anakin and Padme's theme across the stars. It's just such a nice and, it, and it's such a nice theme. And it's almost as recognizable as like the force theme to me, at least the force theme or like the Imperial March. Yeah. And I loved hearing, hearing all of them come back. And especially I think my favorite part or my favorite one or my second favorite, I'll get into my first favorite later, but my second favorite was after Anakin slaughters the Tuscans, he comes back and he's like, He's telling Padme what he did. He's like, I killed them all, all the women yes. and the children. And you just hear, dun, dun, yeah, dun. Yeah. Oh, and it's just so good because you're just like, you know where this is going to go. And this is just him taking his first steps to become Invader. 
it sticks out a lot is what I noticed because I think when we talked last time about themes, I didn't like super notice anything sticking out. I know you talked a lot on the force theme from Phantom Menace, Mm -hmm. but in this case, like the biggest time that I noticed the theme was that one is like yeah. I heard it and I'm like oh that's actually like a, a very cool detail to have that right there and they even like further tied that in with his switching with how much they like cut to Yoda feeling like the yeah. change and the disturbance in the force it all tied together really well like yeah. super well I definitely love that like just little attention to detail where we can see like the change in character exactly and I spe- like bringing up the Yoda stuff I love how because I I know we'll get we'll get into this a lot more in episode three, but even just this episode, I love how the, there was a lot of moments of like anytime something happens to Anakin or you you kind of start seeing him get troubled or taking those first steps to the dark side. Yoda, we always cut to Yoda, and you could see Yoda sensing it. So like that that was a, a scene where we cut to Yoda, and also whenever Obi Wan forces Anakin to stay on the ship uh, and not go after Padme, and, and Anakin doesn't like that. Mm-hmm. It cuts Yoda, and Yoda is just like he looks away, and he's just like shakes his head, and then goes back to whatever. So I like that we always cut to Yoda, and I know they do that a couple times in Revenge of the Sith, and uh, yeah, it, it shows just how powerful Yoda is. It's kind of like they're saying, yeah. "Look at what the most powerful Jedi thinks about this." He, even he can sense what's happening in, in Anakin's mind. So yeah, uh, I, I like that you that you had brought that up because I had forgot about that, but. Yeah. It's going cool. going back to my first, so I mentioned that was my second favorite. My first favorite yes. um, was the end when Palpatine's looking over the clone, the clone army, and he's in his disguise at this at this moment. He's the Chancellor, and you hear the Imperial March again. It's dun dun dun, but it switches and it just kind of fades into across the stars, Anakin and Padme's theme when they're getting uh, married. And it's just such a beautiful transition. Yeah. Even though, even though her marrying him doesn't really make all that much sense, it's still like a really cool, you know, scene. And and the themes playing into each other are really cool as well. And while I'm on the topic of the wedding, kind of get this out of the way, I do like how this is also kind of a parallel to, um, to Empire Strikes Back, to where we have Anakin and Padme standing right right here to like i guess kind of the the middle of the screen and then we have c-3po and r2 standing to the to the side of them and in empire strikes back we have luke and leia looking looking out uh at the at at space and we have c-3po and r2 standing right next to them and it's both the second of their trilogies and it's both after the good guys win technically but more is coming and and at this point, it's kind of like it looks like the good guys have won, but we just came from a shot of Palpatine looking over his whole clone army that is about to, you know, make a big change in, in how Star Wars goes on from here. So in a way, the bad guys have technically won, you know, and it's kind of a cool little parallel to Empire Strikes Back and then this like final shot. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool, too, as well as the themes fading into each other i thought that was overall just so satisfying yeah i actually really i know we can hate on the actual wedding or the implications <laughs> but i actually enjoy that that's the final scene in the movie because of how much it focuses around anakin and his development and how significant significant his relationship with padme and padme herself is going to be in the next movie and Also, even just with the clone scene with Palpatine, like those two things paired together with the themes paired together with all the characters paired together, all of that I feel like is a perfect ending considering what episode three has. And so I love all of the details that fit together really well. Like all of it combined, I think is just a great, a great way to end this film and set up what's next. Regardless mm-hmm. of if, you know, we don't think the <laughs> <laughs> the wedding should happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it was a, a great choice music wise, scene wise, everything. I think it's perfect setup for, for episode three. Yeah. And another cool little thing I saw, I saw this on, on TikTok a while back, but when they're panning up, they're panning up from uh, Anakin and Padme and they're, they're kind of, they're kind of going like this. 
and they're playing their theme and everything. But as they pass Padme's stomach, it's a real subtle, like two heartbeats. You hear a boom, boom, boom. Really? Boom. Yeah. Mm. As soon as, and obviously she's not pregnant at this time, but it's really cool that they're showing, you know, two heartbeats because even though Palpatine has his whole clone army and, and it seems like he has everything in the palm of his hand at this moment, there's still those two heartbeats and that's, that's, there's hope. Hope is still yeah, coming. Yeah. And even if things get, get bad at the end of this next episode, um, we still know that there, there will be some hope in the future. So I thought that was pretty cool. And honestly, now that we're talking about it, that might be the best little sequence in all, all of Star Wars, at least all of the, all of the prequels, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's a perfect ending and it's a perfect scene. You know, the music, the characters, the implications, it's all, it's all pretty cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I had it at first as just, you know, the themes were cool. And then, you know, thinking about it more and talking about it more. Yeah, it's 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 way better. So mm -hmm. another thing I wanted to get into, I want to know if you kind of like this as, um, you know, in terms of like storytelling or mm -hmm. if you thought it was kind of like lazy, I guess. I think it's pretty cool that how how dumb the Jedi are. I mean, Dooku literally tells Obi-Wan right to his face that like Sidious, Darth Sidious, he's he's planning to take over. He tells him the whole, he lays it all out on the table. This is what's happening. This is step one, two, three, and four. And Obi-Wan's like, no, we don't trust you. I don't believe you. And it's like, ah, oh, come on, dude. What? So what do you think about that? Do you think it's good storytelling or do you think it's lazy? I think... I think you're right that there there were a lot of times in this movie where some of the like supposedly really smart characters make stupid d decisions. Like, I I mean even Yoda and Mace Windu. Like even after Mace Windu, like I'm pretty sure he was on Geonosis and he heard about stuff and he witnessed stuff happening, and he no 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 not on Geonosis when when Mace Windu and Yoda are there when Palpatine gets put in power, when they're at the yeah. Senate. They are there and they hear that. Knowing what Obi-Wan has already said, to me, I'm like, how do they not <laughs> piece that together right then? You know, like, yeah. that was the moment that stood out most to me on top of the fact that, yeah, Count Dooku literally just spoiled everything for Obi-Wan. And yet yeah. still throughout I know for the first part of the next movie, people are still going to be debating if he's a Sith Lord or not. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can see hints of that. I didn't, I didn't notice it as much in the Obi-Wan scene because I feel like Obi-Wan was a little bit less in the loop about the political stuff. Cause he's been like on his yeah. own little like side quest. Most of this movie, yeah. the one that stood out more was the, the Mason Yoda when they watched him get appointed knowing what they did. Cause that, at that point it, it seemed just way, way too obvious. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But I mean, while we're talking about Palpatine and this master plan, I, I noticed this movie, not only is it Obi-Wan's story, not only is it Anakin's story, it's very much his story, which is crazy because he doesn't have a lot of screen time in the first two movies at all. And even in this one, he barely has any, and so, well, as Palpatine, he barely has any. As Sidious, you know, he has he has quite quite a lot. But um, his his plan is just the the way he's I've noticed at least the way everything's just falling into motion and how how quick how quick he is with everything and how smart. I noticed like e even from the beginning of the movie, I noticed that he sends Obi Wan and Anakin to to go protect um, Padme, knowing that it'll distract Anakin and start to, to mess with Anakin. Cause he knows Jedi, you can't have attachments, you know, you can't, you can't fall in love and have these attachments, but he knows how, how Anakin feels about Padme. So sending Anakin and Obi-Wan there to protect her, he knows that's going to mess with Anakin a lot and it'll just steer him more towards the dark side. So you can just kind of see his plan. Just it's all coming into motion and, I, I thought that was really cool. And it's very much his story as well, you know? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I think I know at the beginning we talked about poorly written characters and dialogue and everything, but I would say that like Palpatine and more specifically with like his performance and portrayal of the character, it feels 
what like what it should be for what we know of his character in the future of the Star yeah. Wars universe. So I definitely appreciate all the detail that they they put into that. And yeah, I, I like I like how they have set it up. And I'm glad that they don't focus on it too much. Like I feel like this movie focuses other than what we just mentioned about it kind of being obvious because it was basically told to the Jedi. I feel like the way that they told this story and the specific way that they made this movie didn't try to make it too obvious. Like yeah. in the last movie, I know we talked about how they would randomly have like shots of him after certain things are said or stuff like that to make it more obvious. I feel like there was less of that in this movie and I definitely appreciated that aspect of it. Yeah, exactly. So I want to know what what your thoughts and this is kind of you know hopping all over the place but i want to know what your thoughts were on the big battle of geonosis scene what, so we're what, talking about the arena yeah the big arena all the lightsabers all the jedi are, you know out there going around what what were your thoughts on that i i remember from my childhood that being one of my favorites like the most iconic things that i remembered because yeah. like you, you get like obviously Mace walking up and everything, which, okay, let's be honest. When Mace just walked up like that, he should have killed Dooku and Django right yeah. away. Like just get it over with. <laughs> um, and then like when he says, I think you're outnumbered. And he's like, oh, I don't think so. And you just cut and you see like the whole crowd fill up with lightsabers. Like that is so cool. Like, yeah, I love that moment so much. I think... I, I don't know about the the practical implication of the plan how they all yeah. uh, how they all invaded the crowd like they did <laughs> and were just kind of there yeah but I don't I didn't think about it like when watching the movie I think the moment is really cool the battle is really cool I'm not sure how so many of them died to be honest like to the droids I know there was a lot of droids but there was a ton of Jedi so yeah. I was surprised by some of that and also like the one who jumped up straight to count dooku like yeah. what was he doing <laughs> like what was he <laughs> you're, like yeah. if there is a definition of you're not that guy pal it was that <laughs> jedi like you're not that guy yeah so Jeez. but i loved i did i did love the battle and a lot of really cool elements inside of it like cool moments inside of it and like as a whole, it I think it, it definitely worked as a good uh, pseudo climax to the film. Like it felt like it should have been the climax, but then they went yeah. even further with it. And but it was cool. I definitely, I definitely really liked the scene. And I think just from like a, a fan servicey excitement standpoint, it was cool for like all the scene. All of a sudden, we're seeing a ton of Jedi compared to the last episode where we only got to see like the one real lightsaber duel and yeah. also the introduction of both the droid army and the clone army all of that i think it's just cool like it's a fun big finale that felt warranted based on like the fact that this whole movie like a lot of this movie was setting up the clone army and the droid army and this yeah. war that's like inevitable so i definitely liked it for for a lot of reasons i just think it was i just think it was fun yeah it definitely was a really fun, a fun uh, fight, and I'm glad you, yeah, you brought that up. It ultimately is like what what we've been leading up to the whole movie, and we get we finally get to see the clones. And while they might just look like you know a video game, it still was like really really fun and really cool to see them in in battle. So yeah, I thought that scene was amazing. All the lightsabers, you know, everyone everyone getting everything chopped off, especially Jango Fett, like and, and Mace Windu, and I really hope they pay that off in, in like a future, I, let's say Boba Fett uh, season two, you know, I feel like Boba Fett needs to get his revenge somehow. And if you're going to bring Mace Windu back, let Boba be the one to, to finish it off. Cause that scene it was hard. That scene was heartbreaking, you know? And um, it was a shame that Django's story kind of got cut off a little early. Uh, oh, no pun intended, but <laughs> it was, it was kind of sad because I would love to see more of him. And I think it'd even be, it'd be so cool to see Tamara Morrison come back to play Django Fett and, you know, with some practical effects and some like, you know, de-aging uh, just to see like a, a Django Fett series, you know, set before all of this doing some bounty missions and, you know, just a cool little prequel. Cause 
I thought he was sick in this, you know, and he was way cooler than I remembered him to be. And yeah, I, I think there was a lot of cool, cool moments in that. I did like the big monsters, the big creatures. Like one thing I've always, you know, loved in, in movies and shows and stuff is just big giant, like creatures and monsters. Yeah. And I just love seeing stuff like that. So like, last episode in the water with like the big fish and yeah i thought yes. that was all cool and and even now up up to like the mandalorian the book of both i know mandalorian does it a lot with like their big weird creatures and stuff and mm -hmm. um that's a, a reason why i fell in love with star wars in the first place you know just seeing all these different types of space people and weird looking you know species and all that uh i i fell in love with this so this scene i mean i said last last week that I love the attack of the clones and I think it's, it's way better than what people, you know, give it um, for, for reasons like this, it's, you know, personal preference, but yeah, I, I love seeing stuff like that. And it's a big reason why I fell in love with star Wars in the first place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of cool moments in this and yeah. <laughs> I'll just warn you ahead of time. You might, uh, you might roast me a little bit for my rating once we get towards the end. Oh, here, no. but... I mean, you know, uh, I am I'm willing to put bias aside and you know, yeah, give give an honest rating. But personal enjoyment, I loved it. You know, it's it's a yeah. fun movie and it's a big step up from the first one. So yeah. after the Battle of Geonosis, we we go we have a chase with Obi Wan and Anakin confronting Count Dooku. So yes. lay it all out. Tell me what you thought about about this lightsaber battle and and the, the implications of this. Yeah, so the lightsaber battle had its, I feel like it had its up and ups and downs. Like it was pretty hit or miss for me because there were there were moments of really cool like choreographed fighting and everything. There were moments of characters making really dumb decisions that I wasn't like always a fan of. Yeah. And then there, yeah, like going back to choreograph wise, there were some elements where I feel like they sacrificed the choreographing for the story. I know mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier the scene where we see like the red versus blue on Anakin. Those like close up shots of Anakin versus <laughs> Dooku. Yeah, it's <laughs> choreograph wise yeah. is terrible cuz you're not actually seeing anything that's happening. Yeah. But story wise like it's it's an effective tool and I love the the switching back and forth back and forth between the red and the blue. And then I think I, I'm a big fan of any duel that Yoda gets. So yeah. Yoda versus Dooku, I love that. Like him, he's probably has my favorite like fighting style. Yeah. Of yeah. like any Jedi, just because of his agility, him just like flipping around, jumping. It's so pleasing to me to see like the quick, fast paced type yeah. of type of duel. So I I liked it. There were some elements that I don't feel like were like the best inside of it. I still feel like it was effective enough to like get us where we where we need to go and still had a lot of like the the cool fan servicey moments. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting you say you like you say you like Yoda's fight style the best. I like Count Dooku's the best out of out of any any Star Wars character. His uh I think he's like the actor Christopher Lee if I'm if I'm not mistaken yeah. had a had a background in fencing. And oh. so they used his that fight style and basically invented his own around like uh offensers you know with the hand behind the back and the the way he he does yeah. and so i think he has you know the coolest um i don't know how you'd say it the coolest you know fight style of all jedi and so i enjoy his a lot and he i think he has the coolest lightsaber hilt he does so, i was gonna say that. even yeah. when when he first goes to ignite it i don't know if you notice this but it stood out to me when he like flicks it down and it's like uh, perfectly straight yeah i love that yeah, yeah. so Ka cool count dooku all around he's, he's amazing because he he wasn't taking any like pleasure in hurting anakin obi-wan or yoda he would he he kind of had a frown on his face after i think he cut off anakin's arm and he was just kind of like uh you know why'd you make me do that and you know like we said he he tells obi-wan his whole plan uh when they first meet and he's just overall a really cool character because he he was qui-gon's master and he was yeah. yoda's apprentice like and now he's a sith working with sidious it's just he's such a cool character and i i love i love uh count dooku a lot 
and not only his fighting style and his lightsaber, but like him as a character. So I thought that scene, that that duel was really cool. And especially when Yoda comes in just flipping all over the place, because yeah. I mean, up until then, he's just like an old, for anyone that's like first watching Star Wars and starting with one, two and three. Up until then, he's just like a little old. And then in this one, he just like takes off his robe and pulls his saber out. It's like, oh, it's amazing, yeah. dude. So, yeah. yeah. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is I know that for all the spinoffs that we've gotten so far for Star Wars, it's always like in between three and four or after episode six. Yeah. Basically, if there is like if there is one show or anything that I would want the most for them to tell a story pre episode one, it probably would be that dynamic of the story of Dooku being trained by Yoda, training Qui-Gon, turning to the Sith. That's probably like the most interesting thing to me at least for like a story that I would want to see pre episode one. Yeah, I agree. And I even think there's a, I think there's a book out there called Dooku Jedi fallen um, Mm. that explains uh, that shows a lot of that and i i mean i don't read any of the books like the comics for star wars but i think there is a there's a book out there called dooku jedi fallen and it's just about that but i mean to see it live action would be like even better i mean it's really cool that that he not only trained qui-gon but was trained by yoda and even now you can still kind of see that he's not a full sith you know he's not he's not as savage and hateful as darth maul he's not anywhere near like palpatine he's just kind of like this is the way things have to be and he doesn't take any pleasure in in um the way he fights anakin and obi-wan so i think i think dooku is a a top tier star wars character so that scene was amazing we have four amazing star wars characters you know all interacting and dueling it out and for the sake of the story and i loved it you know it was it was very satisfying scene yeah Okay, well, I have a question for you as we get towards the end here, yeah, kind yeah. of mimicking what you asked last episode. Okay. And that is one or two characters that you want to see return from this episode or just themes from this episode that we see play out in the Kenobi show. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so a character that I'd like to see referenced or kind of like, or kind of like, you know, brought back, maybe not brought back, but like kind of like, kenobi sitting there thinking about how everything went wrong i would kind of say that the mace windu and the yoda thing how how they kind of were blinded by everything dooku did and i can see obi-wan sitting there in his regrets you know wondering where did this all go wrong like how could we have stopped it and thinking back to like how blinded the jedi were especially mace windu because not only does, does is he like blinded here but even in episode three you know he's totally blinded to anakin's fall and he doesn't even listen to Anakin when he says he thinks Palpatine's a Sith Lord. So I would like to see what Obi-Wan thought about that and what he thought about like Mace and Yoda being blinded, but also like Palpatine's plans. And it'd be kind of cool to see him sitting there thinking about like, oh, was this Palpatine, you know, all along? Was this why he sent me and Anakin to protect Padme to kind of reintroduce Padme and Anakin again? And kind of like, you know, looking at the looking back on all this and seeing, you know, what what went wrong and and what was all Palpatine and what wasn't. So I think that that would be it for me. And uh, so I guess that falls in like themes and I guess characters. I mean, oh man, that's a tough one. You can't say Django because <laughs> I, I mean Django is one of my favorite characters in this movie. So um, I, I guess characters. You thought of something? I Give did. me yours. Give me yours. First one, it's got to be obvious. Jar uh-huh. Jar. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, you mentioned Django. This is the funny thing. Uh-huh. The I feel like this is the only episode where you can justify this. It's kind of cheating, but kind of Django, considering he was the clone that everything was based Cody. around. Because oh, yeah, yeah. I would love to oh, see yeah. like some some sort of clone that we've seen through episode yeah. three or through the Clone Wars return yeah. through the same actor. Because... Yeah. I, I think I saw somewhere that apparently like somebody thought there was a leak with him on the set of Kenobi or something. Yeah, to remember I, did, I don't remember if that was like a, a real thing or anything, but yeah. I would love to see him come back and just be a clone of some sort. And I know that that's like cheating a little bit, but yeah. other than that, like I don't feel like there are as many in this episode compared to the first yeah. one. So I just shouted out Cody and then quickly remembered that he was in episode three. But 
I shouted that out because he there was also a I want to say it was kind of like a rumor, a very early rumor in Kenobi or about Kenobi saying that a lot of the show was going to be um, Commander Cody trying to track down Kenobi and execute him. And uh, like a, a little team of the of the clones um, led by Commander Cody, were going to try and find Kenobi. But I think that's been debunked now that we've gotten a couple trailers and we see that it's Inquisitors. But I yeah. wonder, since they did change the Darth Maul to Darth Vader, I wonder if that was a rough and early draft of, of what they wanted us to do that they kind of like said, instead of having, you know, the clones and like, and then having Darth Maul be the main villain, how about we step it up and have the Inquisitors looking for him and have Darth Vader be like the big, the big yeah. one. So I wonder, I wonder if that's um, kind of where they went with that, because as soon as you said, you know, started hinting at Tamara Morrison, I was like, oh, Commander Cody, like, give me Commander yeah. Cody. Cause I remembered that, but then I was like, oh wait, he wasn't even in this technically. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. I would, I would want to see Tamara Morrison back. I mean, I love Tamara Morrison, whether it's in book of Boba Fett or, or in Kenobi. I mean, dude, he could play whoever he wants. He has like yeah. millions of options. He could just play random stormtrooper number 500, whatever. And he yeah. just pulls them out. So yeah, that's, that's a good one. I yeah, and going off of what you just you just said about like the switch between the Darth Maul and to Darth Vader and everything, is I feel like maybe if they had it focused around like Maul and around Cody and clones and stuff, it would feel too much like a live action Clone Wars type of thing. Yeah. So that might be why they switched it to just like no, this should be more like unique yeah. than that. You know, it should be more focused on something more compelling like Darth Vader. So yeah. that might be a reason why they switched it, but I'd still love to see some sort of like remnants of the clone wars seep yeah. back into the show. Yeah. It'd be really cool. I mean, like I said, I love the tackle of the clone. So any references we can get, I mean, a, a lot of big things happened in this movie, you know, Anakin and Padme falling in love, uh, Mace Windu killing Jango Fett right in front of Boba. Um, the the Jedi showing how flawed they really are, you know, like Attack of the Clones was it was a really important movie in, in these prequels, which is why I, I like it, which is why I don't think it's the weakest of all of all nine. So going off of that, I want to know your official rating. I'll let you go first. OK, <laughs> I remember. So last week when we talked about Phantom Menace, I gave Phantom Menace. I was between a five and a six. I decided on a six. I think it is like a. It's oh, a yeah. it's a decent movie. And I said that originally I liked this one less. I think I like this one more, but it's not like it's not too substantially more where I can ignore some of the faults of the movie mm -hmm. because I think there are still a lot of very jarring elements like the Phantom Menace. So for this one, I would probably go six and a half. Okay. Yeah. That's respectable. Yeah, that's respectable. Okay. I know a uh, lot of people view it way worse than that. So I oh, feel like yeah. that's still like saying it's a decent, enjoyable movie that has flaws. I don't think that's too much of a hot take. Yeah, no. I mean, that's exactly what, what I think of it. I think I just enjoy it a little bit more. So I think my final rating, I can't remember what I gave Phantom Menace. I would say, I, I think I'd say on Phantom Menace, I would say on a a high a high six to a low seven. And I would give um, Attack of the Clones a mid to high seven. Sure. So yeah. I, I think it, it's just another step up from from Phantom Menace. And in the grand scheme of, of all of all the movies, I mean, it's definitely not it's, it's probably middle of the pack. It's definitely not my least favorite by any means. I mean, I think it's a, it's a very fun movie. It does what it's supposed to do. It introduces a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of really cool scenarios and um, ultimately sets up. The best movie in existence in revenge of the sith so yeah. <laughs> no it, it does doesn't do it does a great job of setting up revenge of the sith so um yeah i, I had no problems with this movie other than dialogue and some cgi so overall you know enjoyed it a lot thought it was a fun movie so i guess with that we will sign off um ben why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and i'll get to our closing statements Yes, I make a lot of content just like Aiden through TikTok, YouTube. I also do Instagram. I'm everywhere just as Aspire Entertainment. And 
I'm I'm honestly most excited to just keep doing these like oh, yeah. through podcasts and everything because next week we're going to have our episode out on Revenge of the Sith and I'm sure we're going to be doing a ton of discussions on Kenobi and everything. So this is like the most fun thing right now is just yeah. having these awesome discussions. So yeah, I look dude. forward to uh, to next week doing this again. Yeah, and you know, hopefully here soon we can we can we can stop uh letting everyone know about you because they'll already know after we do all these episodes and all these all these kenobi shows and all, all these fun things we have planned so i'm very excited but with that we are signing off uh, you can find me on youtube under aiden h talks um that will be for youtube tiktok um all my socials I'm posting every day on tiktok i'm gonna get this up and we're gonna be posting every week here on on uh on here for my podcast words from the nerds and hopefully we can get my co-host on here soon, uh, get him introduced to everybody. And, yeah, I'm excited for what we got planned. And I'm ready to break down Revenge of the Sith next week. And then yes. after that, I believe we only have like a week or so left until we, we get Kenobi. And it'll be very fun. We'll definitely be posting about it, you know, every day uh, up until then. So be on the lookout for that. And, yeah, man, with that, we'll sign out. Thank you, everyone, for joining and listening. I'll see you all later.